My name is Bobby Brill. I am the host of Creative Mind Podcast here at the Academy. And with us today for this Afro Comic Con panel is Michael Buffington. And Michael is a graduate of the Academy of Art University, where he majored in illustration, but he is far more than that. He does game design, CG design, has done a stint with Lucasfilm, uh, is a musician in his own right. And next to him, somewhere in the screen land, is Greg Eichholzer, who did his master's here at the Academy. And he is game designer and worked on some of the bigger games like Dragons of Atlantis, The Godfather, Five Families, and probably most important to this discussion, he is the UI UX lead and author of the... UI UX track here for game design. So two experts in the game industry. So Michael and Greg, the big question. So how do you make a video game? Michael? That is a very good question. And there are a lot of people who are watching this wondering the very same thing. A lot of us play video games. A lot of us really enjoy video games. And some of us even have dreams about making our own video games. But it seems so far away because we just don't understand how video games are made. And so what we want to do today is we want to kind of unravel the mystery of how video games are made so that you can see that it's not something that is so far-fetched that you could never do it. It's not this impossible dream because clearly people do it all the time. And so what we want to do is we want to help you guys understand exactly what it takes to make a game, because maybe there's some role within the game development pipeline, in the game industry that might be perfect for someone like you. And so we want to introduce you to all of these different things. And Greg, that's just a ditto for you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, I think Michael covered uh, quite a bit of it there. Uh, yeah, I think it's, important that when we start to uh, you know dig dig our hands in and, and look at how video games are made and realize how collaborative it really is you know that there is a role for you know just about anyone that wants to get involved in it at some level um, you know there's there's art roles there's design roles there's uh, product management roles there's all different kinds of uh, possibilities for entering the game space. Yeah, I mean, that, and that's a really important point because some people might feel like, oh, well, if I want to get into games, I have to be a programmer. Or if I wanted to get in, into games, I have to be an artist. And, and you can be a producer. You can be a producer, a production manager. I mean, there's so many, there's even, you know, people who do music for games, but there are so many different roles and it takes so much talent to kind of come together to form the team to produce a game because the games are so multifaceted in terms of the needs of each particular project. So there's no one type of person that is best suited for making games. Games really require a team effort almost more than anything else. And it requires a bunch of people to come together with really one goal is to make a really cool, really fun game. Yeah, and fun, fun is something that is definitely uh, a hard thing to measure. Uh, you know, like, you know, it takes it takes a group of people getting together and actually playing the the product that they're planning on releasing to a wider audience, uh, and actually uh, trying to figure out what is the most fun part of the experience. And and you guys are not just talking about games, the PC games, console games, mobile games. There's the concept of gamification now and just about everything that a lot of the stuff that you guys are teaching and and uh, helping people learn that does apply beyond the traditional I'm going to sit and play Xbox or or Nintendo or any kind of game you want to throw in there the, the gamification is is part of our modern day technology and and content creation now absolutely um, there there are plenty of applications for games outside of what's traditionally thought of as uh, an entertainment medium. Uh, the medical industry is pushing into games uh, pretty heavily uh, for upcoming like pro upcoming things like virtual reality, augmented reality to enhance uh, training for doctors. Um, you know, there's, there's 
all kinds of uh, applications outside of games itself. Um, you'll find it in advertising quite a bit. <laughs> I'm sure you've already probably run into this <laughs> in uh, in some of your games and ads. Right. Yeah. That, 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 go ahead. I'm sorry, Michael. Go ahead. With the with the advent of of AR and VR technology, especially it's allowed for more applications and uses of games. It's definitely not just something that kids do. It's, it's gone far beyond Super Mario Brothers um, and into teaching tools. So people are really using uh, games to help teach people um, important life skills and, um, and job skills and things like that. So, you know, it's, it's, it's games serve a purpose far beyond what they originally did. And, and if you can make games that not only um, are fun, but make games that have an application like that, there's, there's always a place for you in the industry. Well, it's interesting that you say that because, I mean, even now there's uh, virtual reality games that are being targeted toward HR training, you know, the most, mm. <laughs> the least exciting of things you could possibly think about. <laughs> right. <laughs> there's no Dungeons and Dragons in HR. Um, <laughs> but mm. so... <laughs> <laughs> or maybe there is. I mean, maybe at a very cool company, you've got you've got uh, Dungeons and Dragons, but uh, right. I'm going to go out on a limb and say no. Um, so let's then. Why don't we get into the concept of actual game design? I mean, where does that start? How do you sit down and go? I'm going to make a game, and it's going to do this. And then you guys look at me and go, "Well, what is this? How do we make this? What do you want?" Well, you know, um, a, a better term is is game development because game design is just one aspect of the game development process. So game development is sort of the all-encompassing term that captures everything that happens within the process of making a game. And the really cool thing is, you know, in the School of Game Development where Greg and I teach, we really teach every single function, um, every single job, that you and 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 role that you have in a game company within the department. So no matter what it is that you want to do in a game, you can come to the school of game development. You can learn that skill and then go out into the real world and get a job at a game company and and do that. So so it's really um, it's really interesting and and we can just dive right into it and we can start going into all these roles and talk about how they all kind of work together. Yeah, I just want to add to what Michael is saying pretty quickly about um, the academy and the School of Game Development. What makes our experience really unique is that the fact that we have every one of these paths of learning in our department, uh, that we can actually come together and bring everybody together from all these different paths to participate in actually building a game towards the uh, end of their, their academic journey. So I, I think yeah, that's that absolutely. really makes it unique. Uh, oh, that, and that's studio. just so important because the worst thing about when you graduate is not having anything in your portfolio. I mean, that is the great thing that the academy does do. That upon graduation, it's like, yeah, here's my game, done. Right, right. Here's exactly. Game. I made a game. I made multiple <laughs> games. Here are my games. Not a yeah. Right. I, I got you know. Throw me on. I can I can figure it out. It's like no, I, I made a game. Yeah, well, and they get their stuff onto Steam. And, you know, they get their stuff out yep. in front of people actually playing it. Uh, that makes a huge difference when you're applying. Absolutely. Well, then let's jump into it. And you guys have a PowerPoint that kind of sets up and walks us through the world of game development. Let's, uh, let's see what you guys have got and kind of see where we can go. And um, I'll be the, uh, the guinea pig and ask some questions along the way that kind of go... Uh, I don't understand what this means. So I, I don't know <laughs> what you're doing. Good. So here, what we've done uh, to to kind of simplify things, so we don't ramble on, is we've just gone to Wikipedia and found a really cool, accurate definition. <laughs> video game development is the process of creating a video game. The effort is undertaken by a game developer, which may range from a single person to uh, like the guy who made Flappy Bird, for example, to an international team dispersed across the globe, like, you know, uh, Ubisoft, or one of these huge companies that's in multiple countries. Uh, traditional uh, commercial PC and console games are normally funded by a publisher like Activision um, or Sony. 
And they can take several years to reach completion. A, a lot of times, big AAA games will take like three years to, to make. Um, indie games can take less time and can, can be produced at a lower cost by individuals and smaller developers. So this is really a, a very good, succinct definition of what game development is. But the problem with this definition is that it doesn't really explain to you all of the roles and all of the effort and talents that are needed to make these games. So it talks to you a little bit about the process, but it doesn't go as in depth. And that's where we're going to step in. And just a quick question for you guys, because there's going to be some terminology that you use that some of the people who who are new to games or, uh, you know, like me or a parent and don't understand. Uh, what's a triple A game? Mm. You want to take that one, Greg? Sure. Uh, so you'll often hear that term AAA game. And really what that um, you can equate to is, um, you know, like a blockbuster Hollywood movie, right? Like if you're familiar with like that big summer blockbuster, like comic book movie <laughs> you know, that comes out that has a high production uh, kind of cost and value to it. Um, that's what a triple A uh, game Really so is. these like are a, like uh, like what Grand Theft Auto, uh, yeah. what is it? The Last As, of Us, the rest yeah, of us, Last of Us, Last uh, of Us, okay, Assassin's Tomb Creed, Raider. Tomb Raider, Tomb Raider. So we're talking millions and millions of dollars in development yes. and, and right. earning. This is this right. rivals movies at this point. Uh, yes. it, it in a lot of cases, I would say that some of these games are can even be more costly than than a movie production. Yeah, it's kind of crazy. What we have here is this is a, a very cool diagram that shows some of the different functions within games and how they kind of work together. So the first one that you see here is a concept artist. Now, um, I am partial to concept artists because I am a concept artist and I am the concept art lead in the School of Game Development. However, the only thing that I would do different about this uh, diagram and I, as I would take the quest designer or the game designer and I would put that first, right? Because the first thing that you need to, to have is a story and you need some sort of guidance for the concept artist. But we'll get back to that. For now, we're going to jump into concept art and I'll explain to you guys what that is. When the game designer, when the producers, when the studio comes uh, comes up with an idea for a game, they come up with a story for a game, they need to, to visualize this. They need to create visuals and, and drawings and paintings of what these things look like. They hire somebody who is a concept artist. Now, a concept artist has a very special skill. They're different than a fine artist. They're different than an illustrator because what the concept artist's job is to do is to take that idea that the game designer has and, and create visuals to sort of articulate that um, on paper or digitally now in Photoshop and things like that. Um, so, so what happens is, is the concept artist is really a professional visual problem solver. So they take this problem, which is how do I take this, this design brief, this write-up of what this particular asset is, whether it's a character or a prop or a creature or an environment or a vehicle or a weapon, how do I take this idea that's written down and how do I put visuals to this? Well, as a professional visual problem solver, the concept artist has four tools, line, shape, color, and value, and they have to combine them together in ways that communicate what the game designer um, and what the studio wants to see out of that game. So you, it's a very special skill set. It's not just somebody who can draw well, paint well. It's not just somebody who can make cool illustrations. It's somebody who is really smart and can really solve problems visually because those are the only tools that you have to do it. And you, you uh, as a concept artist yourself, I mean, the work you've done and what people can go online and look at either on the school's website or just by Google searching, concept art really has become the rock star idea of an artist in the game world because you're really creating the entire look and look and visual feel, like you said, where before people are like, well, I'm really good at drawing a character. I'm really good at drawing the gun the character uses or the, the spear or uh, the giant floating mushroom to go back to uh, Super Mario Brothers. 
But some of the stuff that you've shown me and the stuff you do, it's, it's atmosphere. It's a feeling. It's a genre that Absolutely. puts you into a, a, a state of mind almost that oftentimes doesn't always go into the game per se, but it gives you the starting point to world building, correct? Absolutely. I mean, you know, really in the very beginning stages of design, <clears throat> your, your, you know, we call it pre-production. And so before they really go into production, what you're trying to do is you're trying to create the mood, the feel, the aesthetics. Um, what does the world feel like? When I look at this, that, that, those visuals that I see in that game should evoke certain emotions. When you, when you look at Assassin's Creed, when you look at Dead Space, when you look at some of these different games, immediately when you start to play the game, it evokes a certain emotion in the player. The player should feel a certain way. And that happens through the aesthetics, through the visuals. So you're absolutely right. It's the concept artist's job to set the mood, to set the tone, and to set the look and feel of the game. And that's why a concept artist's role is so critical. And, and you know, like I said, there may be some programmers and some, some uh, character modelers and things like that that might disagree with with that assessment but being biased myself because I am a concept artist I would definitely say the concept artists are kind of like the rock stars they're they're the lead singer the lead guitarist of the production in, in a lot of ways because what you see on screen ultimately was conjured up in their minds and Greg we're gonna get to UI UX and you can completely burn Michael down afterwards Absolutely. I'll completely set you up I'll put it on a tee knock it out of the park we know. I know. I know. Don't worry. That's what I'm here for. Uh, but, but, you know, so give me some examples just very quickly because I know we're, we're, we don't have a whole lot of time. What are some great places to, to start looking for concept art, to some, some ideas of what concept art um, people should, should be looking for? Well, let's, let's, if we go to the next slide, I'll kind of I'll show some, some, some people. Um, actually, we are starting with game design. Mm. Uh, okay. Uh, why don't we do this, Greg? Why don't we skip to concept art since we since we were there, and we'll go back to game design in just a second. Okay, so let me let me give people an idea of what to look for visually. So um, concept art is is really the second step in the game development pipeline. Like we said, um, once the idea is established, um, it's the role for the concept artist to develop that style, the color palettes, the mood, and everything that you see in a game. Now, a great place to go and see concept art is a site called ArtStation. If you go to ArtStation.com, just that first page right there will literally let you step into the world of concept art and you will see everything under the sun from characters to props to environments and it's all mind-bogglingly good. Um, but we have some examples here uh, to help people understand visually what concept art is. Many of the people who are watching this know this little game called Overwatch. Um, and they're quite familiar with this. And this is one of the characters, Farah, from Overwatch. And this is some of the original concept art that was created for this particular character. And what you see is you see um, uh, some of the preliminary drawings, some of the exploratory drawings, and you see the end, you know, the end result, what the character turned out to be is, is very different from some of the original exploratory drawings, but that's part of the process, right? You, you, you start, you don't just draw one drawing and then the, you know, game designer and the producers and everybody, the lead artist says, great, that's it. That drawing is perfect. Usually it takes lots of drawings, lots of iterations, lots of uh, uh, different takes on the same idea before you can really nail down what is best for that particular asset. So this is an example of Overwatch. The next slide is another example of some Overwatch characters. Many people are familiar with Anna and Bastion. I mean, these are really cool characters within the game. And what's really cool is that what we teach in the School of Game Development is we teach people how to create artwork exactly like this. If you look at the next slide, this is an example of some character design work that was done by a student named Pei Zhang. In, that was a, a student in the School of Game Development a couple of years ago. And so you see here, uh, this is sort of a final sort of production ready painting. And what that means is, is that means everything's gotten approved. The preliminary sketches have already been done. 
And, and now they've done action poses. They've done what you'll see what's called a turnaround at the upper right. And that is the front side back three quarter view and things like that, because that's what the 3D modeler needs. And then you see that final sort of hero painting where it's just everything's painted really well so that the 3D modeler can understand the textures and the things that they're looking at. So, But this is an example of student work. And you can see that this is on par with what we did uh, or with what I just showed you from Overwatch, because that's what we do. We train people to become professional level concept artists. So let's let's flip through. And um, just a quick question while that's coming through. You mm -hmm. mentioned that this is separate from the 3D modeling work. So this Absolutely. is essentially two different artists. So these are two different paths that an artist or a student can take where it's like, I can draw all of these great fine art masterpieces and then a 3D modeler can go, I'm not really good at drawing, but I can take your design and turn it into a living, breathing on-screen avatar. So exactly. those are two great paths there, correct? Yes. And, and, and okay. that's what's so important um, about what we're talking about is we're, you know, we're showing people that you don't just have to be a great drawer or a great painter or a great character designer to be in the games industry. You may not, that may not be something that you're really gifted at, but you can, maybe you're really good at modeling. Maybe you just are really good at working with 3D stuff. Maybe you've taken a sculpting class and you really had a knack for it. That may be a sign that you could be a really good 3D modeler and you may be able to take, you may not be able to create the concept art. You may not be able to solve that visual problem and come up with that stuff out of thin air like a concept artist, but you can take those drawings and model them and turn them into something amazing that could be put into the game engine. You know, and and, you know, as you can see, one of the reasons why I chose this work um, was because this work is completely different from what we saw previously. And that shows that there's all different styles that you're going to be doing as a game artist. Sometimes you're going to be doing hyper realistic. Sometimes you're going to be doing super cartoony. And then there's everywhere in between. Another aspect of concept art is environment concept art. And this is the environments, right? The worlds, the, 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 all the different, you know, interior and exterior, uh, uh, you know, spaces that the characters go through as they traverse the world and, and go on their quests. So we'll show you some examples from real, uh, some, you know, professional level concept artists. So this is one of my favorite, his name is Andres Roca. And I mean, this is just very, very high level, beautiful concept art that he's created. Um, and this really sets the mood. Um, now it goes much deeper than this. There's production drawings and things like that, where you have to see very technical drawings of, of the set and of the space. But this is definitely one of those pieces that like you mentioned, Bobby, sets the mood and the tone for the game. And there's another one right after this that's really cool as well. This is also one that really is going to just set the mood and the tone and the feeling that the player is going to have when they get into it. But what you'll see is when you look at the student work that we've produced here, it's on par with this. Uh, as a matter of fact, this particular student was so good that he was hired by Riot because of this particular work that he did while he was in school as a student. This is not work that he did professionally. This is work that he did while he was in school. Do you ever get jealous of these students? Because that would, that would just, oh, it would get me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, ironically, no, I, I, I feel like a, like a proud papa when they get this good. When I see them go from barely, you know, able to draw a figure to producing work like this, and then they go on into the industry and become wildly successful. It just warms my heart. Yeah. That's one of the most gratifying aspects of, you know, what we do in the school. Yeah, I, agree game with, I agree with that. I, I get really pumped up to hear when students I've worked with have gone on and, and, actually gotten into the studio here this is another environment piece and um this this student in particular had never painted environments before they got into my class and this is what they were doing by week 12 so you oh, know it wow. just goes to show you um you know the the level the quality of of what we teach and how important it is because this student uh, pretty much walked out of school into a job and you can see why um, but yeah, let's, let's, why don't we go back to, oh, here really quickly. Um, these are the type of like interests that would probably 
me, you know, be an indicator that you could pursue a career in concept art. So if you really like drawing, painting, designing characters, illustrating, if you like comic books, sketching from life, figure drawing, if you like designing weapons and, you know, uh, robots, if you, you know, if you're one of those kids that drew monsters and your, your, your mom was a little concerned about you, you're probably, <laughs> you know, just a concept artist, you know, and if you like designing environments or just creating the look and feel of the game, those are good indicators that you would be a, a really good concept artist. <laughs> it's interesting because you are talking about concept art and then game design as kind of, you know, which comes first, the chicken or the egg. And right. you can you can see what's like, I've got this really cool idea in my head of what it looks like. And then you've got to team up with somebody who goes, that's great. Now, how does he jump over the wall? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and <laughs> you know, it's it's, you know, that you have you have your game designers that, that come up with the the stories and and like you said what you're talking about that's those are game mechanics you okay, know okay. how does the game work how do the characters move how do they what kind of weapons do they have what what are the power ups all these different things are are important things that game designers you know really um have to think about that concept art we just have to make it look pretty you know, but they're the ones who have to sort of uh, create the engine and sort of make that game work because they're the ones who make it fun. If the game designer doesn't do their job well, it doesn't matter how pretty the game is. Nobody's going to play it. Um, it. One, one of the complaints about um, uh, my son, he had about the Battlefront 2, the, the Star Wars game, was it was basically like one level and and it, it wasn't really that well thought out, he, he said. And, and so he felt like there should have been more to it. So this is somebody that, you know, is, is 13, 14 years old and is feeling this. And so, you know, what that means is, is that there should have been a little bit more work on the front end of this to make sure that this game was fun and then it could be fun mm. for an extended period of time because he didn't say that when he was playing the recent Assassin's Creed. I mean, he played that thing. I mean, he got on my nerves because all he did was play that for like two weeks straight. Um, but that's because it was so fun. I mean, what would you say about game design, Greg? Uh, absolutely. I would say that uh, game design, from my point of view as a UI, UX person, um, the what the game designer is really responsible for is making sure that that core mechanic, that core user experience, what makes the game fun, uh, is really thought through from start to finish. Yep. That it makes good sense. That they've played it enough to feel like it's it's a rewarding, uh, you know, mechanic and process to play the game. Um, Without that, uh, all the rest of the pipeline will suffer, uh, Yeah, as you said. Well, can you walk us through then the, these four big points you have for game design? So rough architecture and flow, that, that seems kind of, that's hard to wrap my head around. So what do you mean by architecture and then flow of the game levels? Uh, do you want me to take this? Like, yeah, yeah, go ahead. I mean, and, sure. and you can show them some of the work too to kind of explain that because it's sure. a really good job of that. Sure. So, um, rough architecture and flow. Uh, I mean, that's that's deciding, uh, you know, at a high level what what the gameplay is going to be. Um, you know, if it's going to be, uh, you know, a side scroller, a shooter, a, a strategy. You know, and then flow is that moment to moment decision. I would say like, you know, where, where does the player start in world one, one and how do they end up at the end of world one, one. So they have to calculate all those little steps along the way. Um, game wide systems. Uh, that's, you know, if you think about different categories of games, right? Like RPGs or strategy or fighting or, you know, racing games, often there's, there's these mechanics and things that affect the game globally, right? Like uh, in an RPG, you might have an inventory system, right? Like that's where you're storing all of the things that you collect over the, the course of the gameplay. That so RPG, that, that's role-playing game, just, just right. to clarify, right? So right. That's, you're going out and collecting <laughs> things. Collecting things, you're interacting with characters, you're, you know, learning about a world through a story. Um, yeah, so uh, documentation 
and um, uh, writing documentation that communicates design concepts to other members of the team. Uh, this is often uh, referred to as a game design document or GDD. Uh, I've heard people call it a spec sheet, you know, or um, uh, just the, the design brief. So there, it can be referred to as a few different things. Um, but really, this is just writing down the instructions for how to play the game, how, how the thing is supposed to be built. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, it's very important that everyone has an understanding and reads the documentation. Uh, now, Mike, Michael and I have been in some conversations with some folks that uh, <laughs> maybe didn't, didn't want to read. <laughs> <laughs> he's shaking his head uh but how dare yeah, like, you tell me what i don't want to do who do you yeah. think you are <laughs> but yeah like uh reading a game design brief and writing it, it it takes an incredible amount of thought uh to put these things together to make sure that everything is going to work uh as best you can um and it's it's what sets up the rest of the team for success right like you you need these these things various tools for gameplay authoring and scripting yeah so something to really kind of note and take uh that that is important in an industry like gaming is that software is always going to be changing we have to stay on top of you know what new engine is is you know, coming out or what updates have happened to that engine, um, you know, what new hardware is coming out. So we have to understand what the limitations are and what tools we have in order to, you know, effectively make a game that's modern and appealing. You always have to be in this thinking and learning mode. Even as a, you know, professional working in a studio, you have to be willing to learn. We've got some uh, game design uh, images here uh, showing some of the level of drawing. Because even as a game designer, you do need uh, drawing ability uh, to some degree. Now, it doesn't mean that you have to make as pretty uh, of concept art like a concept artist, but your drawings need to be clear. They need to visually communicate how something is going to function because You've probably heard the the uh, adage, you know, uh, "pictures worth a thousand words." <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, it, it is definitely true in the case for game design. It's often easier to explain a concept through an image than to write, you know, a, a thousand word essay about how this is going to work. Uh, in you know these particular images, we're looking at uh, some different levels of. Uh, progression, right? Like we're looking at how a character can uh, bounce along mushrooms. And then in level two, the character has to take that knowledge of bouncing on a mushroom, combine it with their little umbrella guy to uh, be able to float along the screen. And then by the end, you have to combine, you know, what you've learned about bouncing off mushrooms, uh, floating on the umbrella in the wind, and then you're adding it to uh, getting an updraft from uh, fire in order to progress along this this level. So, I mean, uh, this, to me, just looking at it, it, it looks, I mean, if I were to take away the imagery, this is almost the, this is like mechanics. This is, this is, you know, the algebra almost of it, where it's like, it's, it's going to jump, it's going to pop, it's going to jump up real high. If I were to take away all the imagery, it would, it would still be understandable. And it seems almost like this is the management side of a game. Well, yeah. I mean, the game designer, you know, is is someone who has to kind of see the vision for the gameplay uh, through, you know, concepting the, the, the vision for how the game is going to function and play in their head and making sure that that vision gets on, on screen by the end. Um, so, yeah, it... it a lot of these types of documents and drawings uh, help make sure that that vision is carried through. Um, now, this is uh, a very, we're looking at <laughs> a very far away uh, 
top down map. Very simple. Uh, Look like you drew it on the back of a napkin. Very easy to understand. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, so, you know, graph paper and uh, pencil and pen can or, you know, be very uh, excellent tools for a game designer. Uh, you know, especially if you have to calculate, um, you know, how much space, like virtual space, uh, you know, is a game is going to take up. Like, you know, if you think about uh, games like uh, Grand Theft Auto that are, you know, virtually miles and miles of a city um, in landscape, uh, somebody had to sit down and, and draw out and figure out how that whole map is laid out and how much virtual space it's actually going to take up. You know, so that's kind of what we're looking at here. And it's got like a nice uh, legend over here with all of the symbols that are being used uh, defined. Um, again, like this is a super valuable tool for many people in the production pipeline. Um, so Michael, what, what would you say that a concept artist would gain from reading and understanding this this map what would they do with it well see what's important about this is you know <clears throat> we would look at this and it would give us a sense of let's say they're talking about a, a particular area area on this map we would see what the player path is we would see what's happening in context and we don't just see this isolated space we see how it relates to the rest of the world and so that really influences how we design that space so we look at it and go, okay, I see how this connects here. Okay, so it should feel like this and this and this. So having this kind of information is invaluable when we're trying to conjure up these images. And, and, and it also helps us, you know, it's really a, a, a huge uh, benefit for us because it helps us get inside the designer's head pretty pretty easily when we see stuff like this. So, you know, and, and then, you know, a 3D, you know, an environment modeler, which we'll talk about next, you know, can take this and model this you know, based on this and the concept art, and they can make that, build that model in 3D so that they can put it into the engine. So, um, but what what kind of, let's look at what kind of skills it would, uh, might, you know, or interest might mean that you would be mm -hmm. a good game designer. Right. So no surprise, uh, you enjoy playing games, right? <laughs> uh, you, you have to enjoy playing games and you probably, uh, I would say like, like playing games with other people, right? Um, you know, you enjoy figuring out the functionality uh, behind things like puzzles and in um, games. Like you're, you're curious about how things work. Um, so you may also like storytelling. Often, uh, often game designers are also uh, storytellers. Um, now that doesn't mean that every single game, you know, has a deep uh, story to it, but you do like to tell some stories and creating worlds. The next in the pipeline after game design, after after concept art, is three D modeling, and and that's something that is also uh, really interesting. We mentioned it before, but three um, D modeling is when you take the characters, the environments, the props that are drawn, that are first, you know, uh, uh, thought up by the game designers. They're conjured up image-wise by the concept artists. We take, the modelers take that information and then they actually build it in a 3D program. And so um, they, they rig it, they, they, you know, create meshes, they light it, they texture it and make it look real. And then they put it into that uh, game engine. So let's look at some some work from a 3D modeler. So this is um, from the game Injustice. This is a, a 3D character modeling because there's there's uh, several different types of modelers, right? There's people who specialize in characters because that's very, very difficult. You need to know anatomy very well and things like that. Um, there's people who specialize in doing props because you'd be surprised how many props need to be modeled. And then there's people who do environments. But this is this is a character, an example of character modeling. And you can see this is some work from a student. You can see how on par it is with professional level um, 3D character modeling. What are, what are some of those programs that 
even if somebody's in junior high, high school, or, or just thinking about a second career in this, some programs they should start thinking about. Is it ZBrush or is it 3D Studio Max or, or uh, what is it, Soft Image from back in the day? What, what are some programs they should be thinking about for 3D modeling? What they use in the industry a lot, they use a, a lot of ZBrush, a lot of Maya, um, and there's some other ones like Mudbox and Moto and things like that. But really, what is fast becoming an industry standard is this program called Blender. And Greg is the Blender master. Uh, and the reason why that program is becoming uh, a standard very quickly is because it's free. And yeah. it, it will always be free according to the creators of the program. And it's just becoming more powerful every year. And more and more people are using Blender as their primary 3D modeling software because A, it's free, and B, it can do almost anything that some of these bigger programs can do and almost as good. And so if I were in high school and I were really serious about 3D modeling, I wouldn't even worry about getting some of these more expensive thousand you know, dollar programs. I would go and get Blender and just learn that because I, you know, it, I imagine in five years, most people in the industry are going to be using Blender. Uh, yeah, I do hear a lot, uh, a lot more of our colleagues getting into it, and I think that's a really good thing. Um, you know, there, I mean, it, it, just to be clear, like, uh, like Michael said, you know, Maya and and some of these other softwares are still like standard, and we do we do teach those. Uh, but yeah, like, you can't beat the price of free. <laughs> you know, right, especially exactly. especially when you're just starting out and, and learning sure. um, and what's great about learning on a free software like blender is that so many of those skills and concepts are transferable um, you know like like I've said you know in yeah. our industry in our industry software is always changing things are always always changing so um, but process and the the working knowledge that you need in order to operate the software and the drawing and you know practical skills that you need to do it those are the the constants so there really is no barrier to getting into video games at this point you really can jump into it relatively simply yeah at this point yeah, uh, you could download Blender for free, and then you can go download Unity and Unreal Engine for free. Um, and you know, the Epic uh, is actually a big supporter of Blender now, and one, with one of their mega grants. So that's pretty exciting um, news for them. Um, but yeah, like there's no real, you know, other than having access to a computer. Well, yeah. Michael, is there more 3D stuff you want to show us? Yeah, let's look at some 3D uh, environment modeling stuff. So um, this is also uh, a sample from the game Overwatch. And you can see how nice this looks. And when you, But when you look at samples from our student work, you can see how, how on par it is with this stuff. Yeah, this is an example of student work um, from Spring Show a few years ago. Um, let's see if there are there a couple more examples. It's also example um, from Spring Show a few years ago. Um, and, and every year they're creating lots of cool stuff. I mean, you know, if you are interested in drawing, sculpting, 3D modeling software, things like that, that's definitely a sign that you probably would make a really good 3D modeler. Beyond 3D modeling, there are other functions within game development. And uh, one of those is one that's near and dear to Greg Eichholzer's heart. This is this is this is the one that uh, it seems to be the fastest growing industry right now for literally everything we touch. Right, that's UI and UX design. I mean, there's nothing that doesn't involve UI or UX design. So, Greg, <laughs> what's UI? What's UX? Go for it. Okay. So, <laughs> all right. Uh, yeah, UI UX uh, literally translates into user interface and user experience design. Uh, so that is, you know, figuring out how an interaction with uh, whatever device you're using should feel, and then UI, uh, user interface art, how it should look, right? So how it should feel and how it should look. Um, 
you know, within user interface and user experience design, you have to have a little bit uh, of an understanding of human computer interaction, a uh, little psychology, uh, visual communication and graphic design. So you still need to be able to draw uh, and you definitely need to understand some of the game uh, mechanics, you know, ultimately because user interface and user experience design in games is a support role, uh, much like concept art and, you know, everything else is supporting that game design document, right? Like all of our work has to support the overall vision of the game and how it should work and how it should feel. Um, so what do these different roles do? So a user experience designer, uh, this is a person that is in charge of taking those game design documents and figuring out what exactly the game designer intends the player to do uh, on a particular screen or a particular part of the game, and then uh, creating a flow chart for what that player may be going through step by step uh, in that process, right? Like if you're, say, you're playing one of your favorite, uh, you know, mobile games, right? Like, uh, like Clash Royale, right? <laughs> you of know? course. Best yeah. game ever. So, <laughs> so if you're playing Clash Royale, some user experience designer had to sit down and figure out step by step what a player is going to go through in order to start a match in that game, in order to build their deck of cards in that game. And, you know, uh, one of the other important functions, figuring out how to get a person from point A to B in uh, purchasing those those gems, <laughs> right? So uh, that is something that a user experience designer is doing. Um, they're also uh, designing those interactions around what feels best for whatever device you're playing on, whether that's a phone, whether that's uh, a console, right? Because, uh, you know, in, in console gaming, that controller is part of your uh, user experience, right? It's part of part of your interface. Um, and PC games, right? Like your keyboard and your mouse are part of your user experience in the interface. So they have to think about where the player is, what they're playing on, and um, you know, then they, they conduct testing often for the game. So they're trying to figure out if their hypothesis of how an interaction should work and feel actually uh, pans out the way that they, they thought it would. Um, so how do we great. simplify that? <laughs> I was going to say, you know, yeah, cause I, Mike, Michael, can you, exp can you simplify it? Cause I mean, it, uh, you, it, it's, yeah, I mean, I'll, good. I'll, I'll, I'll put it, I'll take everything that he just said <laughs> and I'll explain it in my definition. Okay. So, uh, it makes all the buttons in the game look really pretty and it shows you what buttons to press so that you can play the thing that you want to play. So, you know, hit this button, that means start. And, and then this <laughs> button means exit. And, and that's what it means because if you can't figure that out when you're playing the game, it's going to get really frustrating and you're going to be like, this game sucks. <laughs> right. And because yeah. bad UI and bad UX design can, can literally make or break your game. You could have a yeah. great game, but with crappy UI UX, it's, it's going to be a bad game, period, because people aren't going to enjoy playing it. They're going to get frustrated. And I know there's plenty of games like that. And, um, you know, Clash Royale recently, because it's the best game ever, they, they really, they made one small change to their UI and everybody got, through, you know, up in arms because it was like really confusing and they had to go and fix it really quickly because they don't want to lose players. So that's basically what Greg meant with what he just <laughs> right. said. Right, so. exactly, yeah, yeah. Well, I, you know, <laughs> I think the easier one, the one you know, not to take away from all the smarty smart stuff that Greg said. But, Sorry. Because uh, <laughs> he and I talked about this before and I was like, I, yeah, words, math, math words, I don't remember. But a really old universal remote and you just thumb swiping on your phone. If your three-year-old can work your phone, then it's got good UI. <laughs> right. You give me a universal remote, it's just me banging the universal remote <laughs> on the table over and over again until I change the channel. Right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, 
Yeah. UIUX, so, so UIUX is for very, very, it's a higher level of thinking. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, 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 it's thinking, critical it's thinking, thinking it's critical thing. It's thinking at that, 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 that top down way of looking at things. Yeah. yeah. Like you have to, there's a lot of things you're trying to consider, right? Like what people are playing on, uh, what group of people is, you know, part of the audience, right? Like age group and, uh, things can make a huge difference in the types yep. of decisions you have to make. Um, yeah, there's, there's just, it's a, I mean, it, 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 it's a set of complicated problems, but if you like, uh, working with people and testing out ideas, you're probably going to like, uh, creating user experience. Um, well, show them a couple examples of sure. what UI. I mean, I know we've talked about sure. it, but show them some examples of what that looks like. Sure. So, um, so we'll skip ahead here. So, you know, if you've played the game uh, uh, Dead Space, you know, you probably, you're now familiar with some really interesting UI UX concepts, right? Like um, in this game, there's a lot of interface that's actually part of the game world. And then interface that's you know meant to look like uh, for the meant for the player, right? Like now in Dead Space, we've got a, a health bar built right into the back of the character, right? That's that's pretty uh, intuitive, right? Because you are closely associating um, you know uh, something really important, like how close is my character to being dead. <laughs> directly onto the character itself rather than uh, off to the side of the screen somewhere, um, you know, which doesn't make sense for every game, but it, it made really great sense for this game because it heightens that anxiety around keeping your character alive because this game is a, a kind of a sci-fi horror type of game. Um, well, just, I mean, just to quickly interrupt, and that's an interesting point you brought up where, you're changing someone's emotions and feelings and anxiety level through the UI where it's not necessarily bad UI. No. It's a UI that is grabbing you as opposed to, oh, well, right up here's my, my little lifeline. And as I get deader and deader and deader, it's here. But here it's like right here. It's right yeah. here. It's coming to get me. I, I, I'm, I'm panicking. And that's an emotional right. connection right. with your so game. Right. You have to have a certain level of um, empathy for the player and for what they're supposed to be feeling. And that's going to help you make a better decision about where to place certain UI elements to evoke the right kind of emotion. Because, you know, if you were to separate the life bar away from the character and put it somewhere else on the screen, that, that distance, um, you know, physical distance on the screen and distance in um, immersion, right? So you're removing it one step away from the character uh, makes it not as critical feeling as when you more closely associate it. Um, so association, uh, proximity, you know, some of these design elements that, you know, that even concept art kind of shares, right? Like proximity, balance, design, you know, those things also affect uh, your UI art. So this is some uh, student work, uh, and and I wanted to focus in on on the flow chart here. You know, this is often a step that that I feel people overlook uh, when considering user experience in UI design. Is that from a game design document to um, getting to you know something that looks prettier? this is a very necessary step in actually solving how something functions. You can do a lot of really great problem solving at this, you know, fidelity of uh, visualization, just figuring out step to step where, where things are. Um, so if we look from here. So after a flow chart is completed, often it goes to a, uh, what's called a wireframe. So this is where, you're taking all those steps and just doing a gray box design because you're just focusing on, on function. 
Uh, no, I just I just want to jump in here real quick. Sure. I know to everybody watching, this might sound a little boring, um, but I just want to let you know that this is incredibly important to the game development process because everything that Greg is talking about, if this is not executed well, um, your game is going to suck. So, you know, it's really everything that he's talking about is really, really important. And it's it's, uh, you know, it's something, you know, this is this is why the job, the role within the game development process is so important because um, it's such a critical part of what happens um, when you play the game. And I think if you don't believe either of these two guys, go on Google Play or go on the App Store and get a half rated star game <laughs> and spend five minutes with it. And you'll see exactly what UI UX is, because I think, Greg, you know, as you explained it to me yeah. before, good UX and good UI versus bad UX and UI, it, it's 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 night and day. And hey, it, absolutely. It, you'll understand right away just how important well, what Michael right. was saying. The, the, what the way... Is. Yeah, the way I explain that quickly is that uh, in a good game, in a good gameplay experience, you don't even notice that the UI is there. And that, yeah, that's the point. Right, like in a bad game, all you can do is complain about like, well, I had to, you know, go through six menus and hold the button down for two and a half minutes to, <laughs> you know. To, right. Or... Um, old video games where, you know, the A button should be jump, but that game just, you know, switched it to D pad up and right. that would drive me nuts. It's like A should be jump. Right? Well, as you can see, Greg really knows right. this stuff and Greg <laughs> is going to do a, a talk um, later on in the day, specifically about UI UX. And right. like I said, it's an important function within games it's in demand big time so if any of this stuff looks like something that you think is cool or that you would want to do you should definitely attend his talk where he is going to get into it in depth and really right. talk about right. everything that goes into it but we have a couple other things to get to before our time runs out um because there's some other aspects of game development that are really important so we want to move on to those and kind of show you some of the other things that you can do within games as well programming is so important to games that they probably get paid more than more money than anybody in the game development pipeline because they're i mean it's it's like having a really pretty car with really nice rims and a nice paint job and a nice sound system but the car has no gas in it right the car has no engine it's nothing but a shell, right? Your game, no matter how well done the 3D modeling, the concept art, the UI, UX, if there's no programmer to make this thing run, then you've really got no game. And so they, you know, they really do all this stuff. And, and, and you know, not everybody needs to learn how to draw or paint to be in game development. If you're really good at math and you like, you know, um, you know solving problems and things like that, then programming is is something that could really, really be a good role for you. And, um, you know, um, so not everybody in the game development process has to be super artsy. Some of it is very technical, and this is one of those areas. And that's literally all I have to say about it, because all I can do is draw. I draw it, and they make it move. So... <laughs> Why don't but we there are there are some really good programming guests coming up too. So you'll, you'll yes. get a, there's definitely a lot of good stuff up there. They will explain to I mean the, the, the some of these talks that we have coming up about programming are going to do much more justice to it than I did. But I'm just giving you the gist of it. If you like math, then you will be a great programmer. So so tell us then the 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 producer and the roles of of of, of a game. Well, you know, a producer. What a producer does is they kind of oversee the whole pipeline, and they make sure that your game gets done. Um, for example, uh, you know, you need a manager, you need a supervisor to make sure that everybody's doing their job, to make sure that everybody's meeting their deadlines, that everybody's hitting their milestones. You need to make sure everybody has the things that they need down to whether or not their seat is ergonomically correct and whether or not everybody has food because everybody's staying late because there's a milestone that needs to be hit. Like a producer's job is very, very important. And so um, it's so important that they they do get paid well um, as well. 
um, because they sort of oversee the pipeline and make sure that everything goes smoothly. And having a good producer can make the difference between a good game, game development experience and a bad one. That's how important the role is. And speaking, you know, I mentioned salary a couple of times, and this is a survey from Gamasutra, uh, a game development website. Um, and it, uh, you know, this is a little old, but you know, things haven't changed much. I mean, maybe the salaries have gone up a little bit, but this will give you a general idea because I know a lot of people are watching this saying, I want to get into games, but, but you know, my, my, my parents, um, they, you know, they, they don't think that I can make any money and that this can actually be a viable career. And so what I want to show you really quickly is just how um, much you can actually make. Now, here for for programmers and engineers, it says the average salary is ninety three thousand. Let me let me tell you that um, that's that's probably more of like a beginning salary. Um, that's something that you might be making very early on. Um, but high level programmers are making well into the six figures, um, and and sometimes. Uh, just just stupid amounts of money. Uh, sometimes I wish I would have paid more attention in in algebra class. Unfortunately, I was too busy doodling in my sketchbook and getting kicked out of class. But that's besides the point. Um, now, uh, artists and animators; those are your your three um, D modelers, your concept artists, your your game animators, your technical artists, um, your UI UX artists. This is an average salary. I would say this is at this point, this is more like a low end sort of entry level um, salary for most uh, people uh, filling those roles because a senior level, um, you know, concept artist makes, you know, well into the six figures, you know, maybe, you know, 120, somewhere around there. Um, Art directors might make, you know, somewhere higher than that, 130, 140, maybe even 150. And I know that uh, senior level, what, what does a senior level UI UX uh, person make? What do you think? Um, so, I mean, that depending on experience can be 90 to 120. You know, Unless range. you work at Google, then it's like 175. Well, yeah, if, 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 you're, <laughs> if you're at Google, probably like 170. <laughs> well, that, about, that's a good question for you. That's a really good question for you guys, you know, just in the time period we're at. Um, how much of this can be done outside of the big cities or is mm. this done everywhere? Or do you need to think There's, about uh, where you want to live and do we want to talk about that? Um, yeah, I can talk about that for a minute. So, you know, the Bay Area certainly is, you know, uh, a, a hub for like mobile game development. There's well over 200 mobile game studios in the Bay Area. Um, there's also some of the AAA big studios represented in the Bay Area. You know, we've got Ubisoft and EA and Sledgehammer and 2K, like a bunch of big, big game companies in the Bay. Uh, but, you know, game studios are all over, all over the place, uh, all over the United States, all, all across the world. You know, and I feel like in the particular climate that we're in right now, uh, a lot more places are are looking for remote uh, workers because it yeah. is possible to do this type of work uh, remotely. Um, I, I won't say that, you know, working remotely could, could ever totally replace the experience of, you know, sitting next to the people that, um, you know, you'd be handing off your assets to, but uh, it's the, you know, technology that we have right now, allows us to work pretty well uh, remotely. Definitely. Um, I mean, and that's, you know, that's one of the benefits of uh, an industry like this is that you don't need to be in the same space like factory workers, for example. Um, but let's, I mean, let, I mean, we're getting close to the end. Why don't we wrap up and just kind of touch on the last couple of sort of um, salaries here. We have uh, game designers who make sa uh, salaries that are, um, you know, comparable to artists producers obviously we talked about how important their role is they make uh, a, a fair amount in the industry and then we have uh finally 
um, you know, QA tester, that's that's sort of an entry level position. Now, just to be clear, that doesn't mean that you go in there and play video games all day. That means you try to break the video game. You're trying to find problems and bugs and you're writing reports and you're doing stuff like that. So if you think that if you're just going in there and playing a game, that's actually not what that is. And then, of course, you have audio people and those are the people who make sound effects and, of course, your music for the games. But what the reason why we brought this up is because we wanted to arm all of you who are potentially interested in a career in game development with the information so that when you go and talk to your parents about it, you can say, hey, mom, dad, like, I want to do this. And they'll say, you're crazy. You can't make any money making games. You can say, actually, you know, and you can show them, you know, how it's definitely possible to not only make uh, money, but to make good money doing something crazy fun. You know, I mean, it gets stressful, but to be totally honest with you, when you're working in games, our best, day, our worst days are better than some people's best days. So, I mean, you know, it's it's a great industry. It's a lot of fun. You make games that make people happy or help people or help teach people. And, you know, it's it's a really, really cool thing to be a part of. And both Greg and I, having been a part of the industry for a very long time, can both speak to that. And I don't think he does. And I know I certainly don't regret my choice to be involved in the game industry in the way that I am. So I hope that was interesting to you guys. And, and I hope that uh, that maybe you'll think about getting involved in games if this sounds like something that is exciting to you. <laughs>